Now that we have the Einstein field equations, we're going to see how they predict the existence of black holes, gravitational waves, and the expansion of the universe. If you like, you can skip this video and cover these sections in any order, but for the Relativity 108 videos, we're going to cover black holes using the Schwarzschild metric. The Schwarzschild metric is the spacetime metric for a spherically symmetric, non-rotating mass that has no electric charge. It's useful for describing the curvature of spacetime near slowly rotating spherical bodies like planets and many stars. It's also useful for describing spacetime curvature near non-rotating black holes. The Schwarzschild metric predicts gravitational time dilation, the gravitational Doppler effect, the bending of light due to gravity, shifting in the perihelion of orbits, and the existence of black holes with an event horizon with a radius of rs, which is also called the Schwarzschild radius. The metric was first discovered by Carl Schwarzschild, who published it only a few months after Einstein's general relativity paper in 1915. Schwarzschild unfortunately died only a few months later while serving in the German army in World War I. In this video, 108a, we'll start by deriving the Schwarzschild metric from some starting assumptions. Then in 108b, we'll interpret what the metric means, explaining gravitational time dilation and also explaining a black hole's event horizon. In 108c, we'll calculate the geodesics of the Schwarzschild metric, which give the paths of light beams and massive bodies in the presence of gravity, which includes the perihelion shift of orbits. In 108d, we'll cover some alternative coordinate systems for the Schwarzschild geometry that make it easier to understand. And in 108e, I'll cover the gravitational Doppler effect. I may also cover other topics like rotating black holes and the Kerr metric later. When it comes to black hole solutions, we can categorize them for electrically charged and uncharged black holes, and rotating and non-rotating black holes we're going to look at the uncharged non-rotating case, called the Schwarzschild solution. So we're now going to find the Schwarzschild solution to the Einstein field equations. But what exactly does it mean to solve the Einstein field equations? It basically means we put in an energy momentum tensor T and solve for the metric G. So we put in a description of the mass, energy, and momentum in spacetime, and we get out a complete description of the geometry of spacetime. Using the metric, we can then solve the geodesic equation, which will give us the paths of massive objects and light beams through curved spacetime. So we'll know how gravity affects mass and light. So what type of energy momentum tensor will we use to get our spacetime solution for a spherically symmetric mass? Well, we know inside the Earth we have mass and pressure, so the energy momentum tensor inside the Earth is non-zero. But outside the Earth, we can assume space-time is approximately a vacuum, so the energy momentum tensor is zero. In this video, we're just going to focus on space-time in the exterior vacuum region only. So we're going to set the energy momentum tensor in the Einstein field equations to zero. We're also going to set the cosmological constant to zero, since it's basically negligible unless we're working at cosmological scales. If we take the trace of what's left, using the inverse metric to raise an index, the trace of the Ricci tensor is the Ricci scalar, and the trace of the 4x4 identity matrix is 4. So we end up with the Ricci scalar being zero. So for a vacuum region, the Einstein field equations simplify to just the Ricci tensor being zero, which we call a Ricci flat spacetime. Now, the vacuum outside the mass still involves curved spacetime, because the Riemann curvature tensor here is non-zero. But the Ricci tensor is zero, and this means there are no immediate changes in the volume of a group of test particles outside the Earth as they move along geodesics. We only get tidal forces that squash and stretch the test particles without causing any immediate changes in the volume. So our job is to take this equation and solve for the components of the 4x4 spacetime metric that describes the curved spacetime near a body of mass m.
We're also going to assume that, as we move far away from the mass, the effects of gravity become negligible, and spacetime becomes basically flat, described by the Minkowski metric. Now, before I start solving for the metric, I'm going to do a quick review of spherical coordinates. You can look at the video timestamps to skip this section if you want. Since we're dealing with a spherically symmetric mass, it's better to deal with spacetime in spherical coordinates. So instead of using the spacetime coordinates ct, x, y, z, we'll use ct r theta phi, as defined here, where r is the radius, theta is the angle from the north pole, or co-latitude, and phi is the angle of rotation around the vertical axis, or longitude. And as a reminder, we'll sometimes denote these four spacetime coordinates using the 0, 1, 2, 3 indices, where 0 indicates time and 1, 2, 3 are the spatial dimensions. And in summations, when we use a Greek summation index, this refers to all four spacetime indices. But if we use a Latin or English letter for the summation index, this just refers to the spatial indices without time. If we change from the Cartesian coordinate basis to the spherical coordinate basis using multivariable chain rule and calculate the dot products of the basis vectors, we get these components for the metric tensor in spherical coordinates. The spatial dot products have negative signs in front because in our mostly minus convention for the metric, space-like vectors have negative squared lengths. Remember, the components of the metric tensor are just the dot products of the basis vectors in our space-time coordinate system. So the metric tensor helps us measure lengths and angles in space-time. So both of these metric tensor matrices represent flat Minkowski space, but one is for Cartesian coordinates and the other is for spherical coordinates. The reason you see coordinate variables like r and theta in the metric components is because the theta and phi basis vectors change length depending on their position in space. For example, the phi basis vector is bigger near the equator, and both the theta and phi basis vectors get longer as we move away from the origin. So this should be the metric far away from the mass, as r approaches infinity and spacetime becomes flat. But close to the mass, the metric components of the curved spacetime are unknown. We can use some assumptions to narrow down the exact form the metric components should take. First, we're going to assume that spacetime is static. The technically correct definition of static spacetime involves a concept called killing vectors, which I haven't covered yet. So I'm going to use a simplified definition. We'll take static spacetime to mean two things. First, the metric doesn't depend on time, and second, that spacetime is symmetric when we reverse the time coordinate. This is like mirror symmetry across the time axis. This guarantees the black hole isn't rotating, because if we reversed time for a rotating black hole, the gravitational effects due to rotation would also reverse direction. Since basis vectors are just partial derivatives with respect to a coordinate variable, reversing the direction of the time coordinate also reverses the direction of the time basis vector. This does not change the GTT metric component since the two new negative signs cancel out. But it will change the sign of ET dotted with any of the EI space basis vectors. Since GTI equals negative GTI, these metric components go to zero. If we want spherical symmetry in space, the theta and phi components of the metric should resemble the metric for a sphere of radius r. However, we also allow multiplication by a radial function c of r, since this doesn't violate spherical symmetry. I'm also going to make these terms negative since space-like vectors have negative metric components in the mostly minus metric convention. If we want the radial basis vector ER to stick out normal to the sphere in the radial direction, it must be perpendicular to both E theta and E phi. So these dot products and metric components go to zero. So under our assumptions so far, the metric is diagonal. The remaining GTT and GRR components should only depend on the radial coordinate R 
if we want to maintain spherical symmetry. So we'll call them a of r and negative b of r. We're using a negative sign since this metric component corresponds to a space-like direction. Now, to simplify things, we can always redefine the radial coordinate r to be r tilde equals r times the square root of c of r. And this would eliminate the function on the last two metric components. However, I'm not going to bother writing out r tilde everywhere, so I'm just going to rewrite the new radial component as r instead. Just as a warning, some texts might write these a and b functions as exponential functions instead. They do this because they already know that getting the right answer involves using terms like partial a over a, which becomes much simpler if you use exponential functions. But I'm not going to bother using this exponent trick in this video. So we've simplified the form of the metric as much as possible. In order to solve for a of r and b of r, we'll have to calculate the connection coefficients, calculate the Ricci tensor components, and then force the metric to give us the results of Newtonian gravity in the limit of low velocity and weak gravity. And this will give us the Schwarzschild metric. So let's start by calculating the connection coefficients. There are 13 non-zero connection coefficients in the Schwarzschild solution, and only 9 of them are independent. Calculating them is pretty boring, but necessary. I'll start by solving for the connection coefficients with a 0 upper index, then a 1 upper index, then the 2 and 3 upper indices. So here's the standard formula for the connection coefficients. Since the metric is diagonal, we can easily get the inverse metric just by taking the reciprocal of all of the diagonal elements, denoted by g with the upper indices. So here's the standard formula for the connection coefficients. But since we know that our metric is diagonal, its two indices always need to match, if the components are to be non-zero. So we can rewrite the sigma alpha inverse metric with repeated sigma sigma indices to make it diagonal, and replace all other alpha indices with sigma. So this is not a summation over sigma here, it's just denoting that these two indices always need to be the same. Now let's look at the connection coefficients with 0 on top. With 0, 0 on the bottom, all the time derivative terms go to 0, since g0, 0 doesn't depend on time, so we get 0. If both the lower indices are the same spatial index i, these metric components here are not diagonal elements of the matrix, and therefore they must be 0. From now on, I'm just going to cross out non-diagonal metric components without saying anything out loud, since it's going to happen a lot. This time derivative term is 0, since the metric components don't depend on time. And if the lower indices are both spatial but not equal, all the metric components are off-diagonal, so we get 0. In the case where one lower index is time and the other is spatial, this term survives. G inverse 0, 0 is 1 over A, and G 0, 0 is just A. This spatial I derivative can be any of partial 1, partial 2, or partial 3. Or in other words, partial R, partial theta, or partial phi. Since the A of R function only depends on R, only the partial R term gives a non-zero result. So the lower 0, 1 and 1, 0 coefficients are non-zero but 0, 2, and 0, 3 go to 0. So those are all the connection coefficients with a 0 index up top. Now let's continue to the coefficients with a 1 on top. For 0, 0 on the bottom, we get negative 1 over b here, and the r derivative of a, giving this. For 1, 1 on the bottom, these cancel, and we get negative 1 over b times the r derivative of negative b. With 2, 2 on the bottom, we get negative 1 over b, and the r derivative of r squared, which is just 2r. So we get negative r over b. And for the 3, 3 on the bottom, we get the same thing multiplied by sine squared. When one of the lower indices is 1, all the coefficients go to 0, 
either because they're off-diagonal or constant with respect to a derivative. Any other mixed lower indices give all off-diagonal metric components, so they go to zero too. So these are all the non-zero coefficients with one on top. For the two on top coefficients, having zero, zero, one, one, or two, two on the bottom all give zero. But three, three on the bottom gives us negative one over r squared for the inverse two, two components, and the derivative with respect to theta of the 3, 3 component. The negative 1 over r squared and negative r squared cancel, and the derivative of sine squared is 2 sine times cosine. If one of the lower indices is 2, then having 1, 2 on the bottom gives us a non-zero term, which simplifies to 1 over r. Any other mix of indices on the bottom all go to 0. So these are all the non-zero coefficients with two on top. Finally, for the three on top coefficients, if we have repeated lower indices that are not three, the off diagonals go to zero, and the last term goes to zero since the metric components don't depend on phi. And the three three lower indices go to zero as well because nothing depends on phi. For zero three on the bottom, we get zero. For 1, 3 on the bottom, we get the derivative of g3, 3 with respect to r, which is non-zero. Canceling sine squared and churning through the derivative and algebra, we get 1 over r. For 2, 3 on the bottom, g3, 3 depends on theta, and canceling r squared and working through gives us cosine over sine, which is the definition of cotangent. All the other mixed lower indices go to zero. So now we have all nine of the independent non-zero connection coefficients. And even though I'm using the mostly minuses metric, all of these coefficients should be the same in both the mostly minus and mostly plus metric conventions. And if you want to view these connection coefficients as arrays, they would look like this. So given these connection coefficients, we're now going to calculate the formulas for R00, R11, and R22. Remember, our Einstein field equations tell us that all the components of the Ricci tensor are equal to zero. We'll see that these three equations will be enough to solve for our A and B functions. Remember, given the Riemann tensor, the Ricci tensor is just the Riemann tensor with its upper and lower middle indices summed together. So the 0, 0 Ricci component looks like this. Now, there are a lot of summations here, like the summations over mu, alpha, and beta. But it will turn out a lot of these summation terms go to 0. For each of the four terms here, we need to look at the non-zero connection coefficients and decide what the non-zero coefficients in these summations are. For example, the first term has two zero indices on the bottom of the connection coefficient, and there's only a single non-zero connection coefficient with two zero indices on the bottom, which is the one zero zero coefficient. So this means that even though the mu index is technically summed from zero to three, only the mu equals one term stays around. With this second term here, there are actually no coefficients with zero on the lower right, with the other two indices matching. So it goes to zero. For the third term, looking at the alpha index, with two zeros on the bottom, alpha must be one for this to be non-zero. And for the fourth term, looking at the beta index, we see that beta could be zero or one, but not two or three. So the beta summation expands to two terms. We still have some mu summations left. Here, mu could be either zero, one, two, or three. So this expands to four terms. For the last two summations, mu must equal one in the first summation and mu must equal zero in the second summation. Now this conveniently cancels with this, and since the two, two, one and three, three, one coefficients are equal, I'm going to group them as two times the same term. We're now ready to sub in the formulas for the connection coefficients. 
Most of these we can just multiply together, but this derivative term with the one coordinate, which is the r coordinate, involves product rule for the product of partial r a and the reciprocal of b. We get the second partial derivative of a in the first term and use power rule on b to the negative one to get b to the negative two times negative one times a chain rule derivative term. Rewriting, we get this. Now remember, all of this is equal to zero since the Ricci tensor is zero in our solution. To make this easier to read, I'm going to replace the partial derivative of a with respect to r with a prime and replace the partial derivative of b with respect to r with b prime. I'm also going to multiply the equation by a common denominator of 4ab squared r to get rid of the denominators. So that was r0,0. For r11 and r22, I'm just going to run through them quickly. You can pause the video if you want to check the algebra. For r11, we have mu equals 1 here and expansion to 4 terms, alpha equals 1 here and expansion to 4 terms. We get another expansion to 4 terms and mu equals 0, 1, 2, 3 for the rest. Then we do some cancelling and grouping of like terms. After subbing in the coefficient formulas, we need to do product rule on the first term and use power rule on 1 over r to get 1 over r squared times negative 1. We can then do some cancelling and combine terms and we multiply by 4a squared br to get rid of the denominators. For r22, we have mu equals 1, mu equals 3, alpha equals 1, and beta equals 1, 2, 3. This sum expands to four terms, and then we have mu equals 2, mu equals 1, and mu equals 3. Then we cancel, and factor like terms. After we sub in the formulas, we have to do the product rule on r times b to the negative 1, and also cotangent, which is just cosine times sine to the negative 1. So we have product rule and product rule. This is just plus 1, and this is cotangent squared. So we cancel, distribute, combine, and multiply by 2 times ab squared to get rid of the denominators. So all these Ricci components equal zero. This means that if we add r0,0 and r11, the result should be zero. If we sum these terms in r0,0 and r11, these cancel, these cancel, and these cancel. So we get 4ABA prime plus 4A squared B prime equals zero. If we cancel 4a from both terms, we get b a prime plus a b prime. This is just the product rule result from the derivative of a times b. And since this derivative is zero, this tells us that a times b is a constant, which I'll call capital K. Now we know that as the Schwarzschild metric goes out to r equals infinity, it will approach the flat Minkowski metric where a equals 1 and b equals 1. So in this limit, a times b equals k becomes 1 times 1 equals k. And since k is the same constant for all r values, k equals 1 for all r. This means that b equals 1 over a for all r. So knowing the r22 formula and that b equals 1 over a, and that b prime is the derivative of 1 over a, which is negative a prime over a squared, we can substitute in for b and b prime. If we cancel factors of a and add these together, cancel the twos and rearrange, we get the differential equation r times a prime equals 1 minus a. The solution to this equation is a of r equals 1 minus a constant small k over r. If we calculate the derivative of a, we find that it's k over r squared. And if we plug a prime and a into our differential equations, r's cancel here, ones cancel here, and we get k over r equals k over r. So this solution satisfies the differential equation. So we've solved for a of r equals 1 minus k over r, and b is just 1 over a.
So we have the form of the Schwarzschild metric. Now we just need to solve for the constant k, which ends up being 2gm over the speed of light squared. This is called the Schwarzschild radius, or the event horizon of the black hole. We can solve for the lowercase k constant by forcing the Schwarzschild metric to reproduce Newtonian gravity in the limit of low velocity and weak gravity. For this part of the video, I'm going to use the Minkowski metric in Cartesian coordinates instead of spherical coordinates. I showed in Relativity 107F, during the derivation of the Einstein field equations, that we can force the geodesic equation to match the Newtonian equation for acceleration due to gravity. In the limit of low velocity, the proper time is approximately equal to the coordinate time t, and an object's four velocity vector components are dominated by the time component, which is basically c, with the other components going to zero. To get the geodesic equation to match Newtonian acceleration, we need the I00 connection coefficient to be 1 over c squared times the partial derivative of the gravitational potential phi in the I direction. Now, when we say we're taking the limit of weak gravity, this means that the metric can be written as a sum of the flat Minkowski metric eta plus a small change h, where the components of h are much less than 1. This basically means that when we do a summation with the metric, the h part is small enough to be ignored. But when we take the derivative of the metric, we ignore the constant Minkowski part in Cartesian coordinates and only get the derivative of the h part. So if we take the formula for the connection coefficients and look at the i00 case, this inverse metric can be approximated by the flat Minkowski metric and these metric derivatives are equal to the derivative of the h part. And since the metric is diagonal, we know this alpha index must match the spatial index i if we want the components to be non-zero. The first two terms are off diagonal and go to zero. And the space diagonal elements of the Minkowski metric are all negative one in Cartesian coordinates. So we're left with gamma i00 equals one half times partial i of h00. But recall that gamma i00 is just one over c squared partial i of the gravitational potential. If we remove the derivatives on both sides, we see that h00 is just two times the gravitational potential over c squared. In Newtonian gravity, the gravitational potential for a spherical body of mass m is negative g times m over r. This is what gives us the standard Newton's law of gravity after taking the gradient and multiplying by a second mass. So h00 equals negative 2gm over c squared r. So since we've solved for h00 in Cartesian coordinates, We've also solved for h00 in spherical coordinates, since both coordinate systems use the same time coordinate. Comparing this to the form of the g00 component of the metric that we've derived, the constant small k must then be equal to 2gm over c squared, which we can plug into the formula for the g11 component as well. This component 2gm over the speed of light squared is also called the Schwarzschild radius, and is often denoted by R subscript S. This completes the derivation of the Schwarzschild metric. One last thing before I conclude. A few slides ago, some people might point out that cancelling derivatives on both sides here doesn't make sense, and the correct thing to do is to integrate both sides, which gives an additional constant of integration giving this for h00 and this for g00. But since we want the metric to reduce to the flat Minkowski metric as r goes to infinity, we're forced to set this integration constant to zero. This is similar to how the Newtonian gravitational potential, negative gm over r, can also have an extra constant added onto it, because the constant goes away when we take the gradient. This constant is the potential's value at infinity. So this value must be zero if we want the potential to be zero infinitely far from the mass. So to summarize this video, 
We derived the Schwarzschild metric, which is the space-time metric for a spherically symmetric, uncharged, non-rotating mass, together with the additional assumption that space-time is static, meaning in our coordinate system the metric doesn't depend on time, and also space-time doesn't change when we reverse the direction of the time coordinate. This solution is only valid in the vacuum region outside the mass, not within the mass itself. And we also treat the cosmological constant as being negligible. In the next video, we're going to interpret what this metric means, and we'll see how it results in gravitational time dilation, how it affects light, and how the Schwarzschild radius Rs is interpreted to be the event horizon of a black hole which is a radius beyond which light can never escape.